Well, um, my name is Micah, and I want to say good morning to you, Jumbo. Yes. Good morning to you, uh, Congolese brothers and sisters, and also if you're online, good morning to you. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and we have a special morning plan for you. We have baptisms. The first service, we had four people baptized, um, which was just such an awesome time to hear each of them. And yeah, super exciting. Um, and if you want, you can go on and watch that on our uh, YouTube channel. You can check out those baptisms if you want to see who was baptized and hear kind of their stories. But uh, we are going to, leading up to a time of baptism, which we're going to have in this service as well, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 3. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, if you have a Bible, or you could grab a phone or iPad or whatever and navigate to the Bible that way. But we are in a series called We the People. Now, this may ring some bells because it's the first three words of our Constitution as Americans. On week one, I shared a study that was done where um, several, quite a few Americans were interviewed. They were asked how happy or unhappy they would be if one of their children married someone from a different religion. And the response was that 19% of Americans said they would be unhappy. 81% said they wouldn't care. They asked the same group of people how happy or unhappy they would be if their child married someone from a different political party. And the answer was that 40% would be very unhappy compared to just 19% related to the first question. What this means, probably among many other things, that on some level politics in America has become more important than faith. We would rather people vote like us than believe Jesus and be saved. So we're going we're gonna to continue in this series in the book of 1 Peter, and, and I've been trying to, hopefully, I don't know if I've been succeeding, but to be careful to honor our country, to recognize the fact that we are Americans. This is an amazing place to live, unprecedented in history, and yet at the same time highlight the distinction between our identity as simply Americans, which is sometimes how we can tend to function and our identity as Christians and how those two things interact and specifically to address any political idolatry that has removed Jesus from his rightful place in the church. So First Peter, and we're in chapter 3 today, we're going to read the last five verses of this chapter this morning and look at, as we see these verses, tracking Jesus' journey from the cross to where he says he ascended into heaven. Jesus goes on this journey, and we're going to look at the steps of that journey. But before these verses, if you were here with us last week, Peter talked about how we're called to live life together, life with each other. And, and I described it in a word as humility, putting each other first, sympathizing with one another, getting into each other's lives, caring for each other. Uh, we talked about that, how life together should look. But then we also saw Peter tells us, how do we live life in the world? It's very different when you're with people who don't believe what you believe. What do, what do I do? Do I, do I argue with them? How do, I, how do I treat them? Peter talks about this. And, and whereas humility was the greatest characteristic of God's people, how they love one another, we see that hope is what we are called to radiate to a world that ultimately has no hope. Now we have all these things that we, we run to from thing to thing, temporary pleasure to temporary pleasure in this life, but there's no ultimate hope for a person apart from Christ. After this life, it's it. And so as Christians, we of all characteristics should be radiating the hope of Christ. And the way we do this, Peter argues, is that even when we are mistreated, even when we're suffering, even when we're, ex we're excluded from the conversation, he says in verse 14 of chapter 3, don't be afraid or troubled. How many times when you see something uh, sort of coming in against the church or God's people or, or your values being trampled on, how many times do you feel troubled or fear? What's happening to my country, you know? And he says, don't. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Here's your response. I want you to honor Christ the Lord as holy. The way to radiate hope to a world that is so desperate for hope is to be and to stay as close to Christ as possible through his spirit, through his, his word, abiding in his love every moment so that I can be prepared, he says, be prepared to give a defense for the reason for the hope that you have. And that's how we're prepared. We stay close and keep Jesus where he belongs in our perspective and in our hearts. And so right after he writes about our suffering, our experience of rejection. Peter does, as he so many times in the letter already, 
directs our attention to Jesus, the ultimate example of suffering. So 1 Peter 3, 18 is where we're picking up this morning. He says, for Christ also suffered. He's reminding us that this is not something that's just us. He also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. There's a lot in these verses, but I said there's this journey that Jesus went on. We see the cross, and then by the end, these angels, authorities, everything is subjected to him. And so the headline for this section for me is Jesus wins, <laughs> and we win. Now, when I say that in America, you may hear we and think, yes, we, a political party. That's not what I mean. You may think we, people in the church versus the people in the world. That's not what I mean. We, as those who are in Christ against our enemy, the devil, and all of his scheming, ultimately what is behind all of the evil in the world, we win. And that's what we see here. All the authorities and powers are subjected to him. But what we also see in these verses is this victory is not without cost. One of the recurring themes in both of Peter's letters is that uh, the suffering that we must endure, that we face, that we experience on our way to the experience of his glory. This is how Paul puts it in Philippians 3. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Who wants that? That's great, right? You're like, yep, that's, that's, I just want to stay here. <laughs> but then he says, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Anybody? But this is why. Why is Paul saying this? He's saying, so that, verse 11, one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. In other words, he's saying, I know Jesus wins. It's his victory, and I want to be a part of that no matter what. And so I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. And this is the picture of baptism, that we're, we go down, we're buried, we die. <laughs> we're buried with Christ, but then we don't stay there. We come up to new life. And these verses describe this journey that Jesus took between the suffering of the cross, and the glories of heaven. And these verses between 18 and 22 are, are, are verses that we don't talk a lot about, uh, this journey Jesus went on, because I think, frankly, we don't have much about in the Bible. We don't read a lot about it. But um, between verses 18 and 22 are just these interesting verses. Martin Luther once said of these verses uh, that God alone knows the meaning. <laughs> I'm not one to argue with Martin Luther, but I, I would not go that far as to say, well, God alone knows the meaning, considering that according to 1 Corinthians, we've been given the mind of Christ. Uh, we've been given his spirit, and Jesus said, my spirit will guide you into all truth. Considering that we know God's heart for his church is not confusion for us to go, well, shucks, I don't know what this is all about. But I will say this, that in, in areas where we just don't know for sure it's good to lead with humility and to just admit, hey, there's so much that we don't know, and every one of us will stand before God one day and be wrong about something, right? But as we read these verses, we, we see these reference to Jesus preached to the spirits in prison. You're like, okay. And then Noah's Ark somehow makes an, like an honorable mention in here, and then baptism saves you. And so it's almost as if Peter, who has been in my thinking, building this logical track of our identity. Every week we're talking about it. We're a holy people and a people of light and submissive people. And all this makes total sense. And then he just, on sort of the interstate, just veers off into some random town, you know. We're like, what are you doing, bro? Um, but what I would want to point out and what we're going to see this morning, I'm actually excited for, is this is God's word. And he has inspired these words to not only be written, but to be included for our building up and for our... Uh, basically to know and to understand not only more about who we are, 
but what Jesus has done for us. So we're going to talk about these verses a little bit, but let's pray. Would you join me in this? (sighs) Jesus, we recognize that you are the living word. You are the one who didn't just sort of oversee the assembly of of a book, but you are the one who is alive today speaking to us. And that every single person who's here or who's watching has something they need to hear today. And so, Jesus, we're asking by your spirit that you would fulfill your promise that, that Jesus made, that you'd guide us into all truth, that you'd lead us into a deeper experience and understanding of who you are, of what you want for us, especially related to these verses that we just read. Uh, God, there's going to be things that we, we know we can look at biblically and say, this is, this is for sure. Give us confidence and clarity. And there's going to be things we don't know. Would you just give us humility as we talk about these things, Jesus? Amen. So uh, I mentioned the journey uh, that Jesus went on. I don't know what the like, longest journey you've ever been on. Longest trip. I drove a Volkswagen van to Alaska in uh, college. 7,500 miles by the end. Uh, super fun trip, very, very memorable. But Jesus, he's only in the grave for three days, right? But he covers a ton of ground in that time on this journey. And it begins with the cross. Verse 18 says, Jesus suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. This is a loaded verse. It tells us not only that he suffered, it tells us for whom he suffered, the unrighteous. Who's that? Yeah, no offense. Raise your hand. (laughs) Yeah, that's all of us. Every single human being, the Bible says, all have sinned. There's nobody who fulfills God's will perfectly except Jesus. He is the righteous. He suffered for us, for the unrighteous. But then, not only for whom he suffered, but why he suffered. Why did Jesus suffer? What does Peter say? To bring us to God. I love how Peter doesn't say to get us to heaven. Which is sometimes the perspective of Christianity is you, you, won't have, you get to go to heaven one day, right? Or to make you a better person. Many approach Christianity with sort of this moralistic mindset. Jesus had some good things to say about life. He says, no, the reason God sent his son to suffer and to die was to bring you back to him. Not just one day, but two days. To live life with you, to to be close to you, to have you feel his presence. And when you're struggling to be able to say, oh God, and he said, I'm here, I'm with you. That's what he made us for. That's what the garden is, him walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. And that's what was broken when they disobeyed God, when they didn't trust God, was relationship. You've probably heard the word reconcile. It's a very well-known and and, and described concept in the Bible, reconciliation. That word literally means, re-con, means back with. That's what the whole ministry of the gospel, that's the purpose of Jesus dying on the cross, is to get us back with God. But then Jesus suffered, it says in verse 18. What happened after that? What happened to Jesus after the cross? The grave, right? If you're you're tracking Good Friday to Easter, you would say the grave, and that's true. After the cross, his body was put in the grave, but Peter says, even though his body was put to death, he was made alive in the spirit, verse 19, in which... In his spirit, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So, picture this. His body is lifeless in the grave. He's not there anymore. But it says that in his spirit, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now, the question, quite a few questions, right? Where did he go? Where's this place? Who are these spirits? And what did he proclaim? Peter tells us Jesus went to a prison, a prison for spirits. I asked about the longest trip. What's the worst trip you've ever been on? (laughs) Like one that you're like, I would never go back there. Once was enough. It would be hard to beat this, this spirit prison. Um, And obviously this is no place we've ever seen, but Peter refers to this in his second letter as a place known as uh, Tartarao or Tartarus. You may have heard that. 2 Peter 2, God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into, the Greek word is Tartarus, in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. Translation, prison. 
These spirits are thrown into prison. He's proclaiming to these spirits. Now, spirit, by the way, this word he uses for spirit is used almost exclusively in the Bible to refer to angelic beings as opposed to humans. So he's, he's proclaiming to these, these spirits, or as Peter says, angels who sinned. And I just wanted to say, as we're looking at this, and this is important, I'll just confess, it's, it's hard to know studying and, and sharing and teaching what's relevant, you know? Like, I know we all live in really different places, and some people are coming in like, I just need some hope for tomorrow. <laughs> I trust you're going to get that today. Uh, some people are like, man, let's, let's get into it, right? Let's get out our reference books. I, my heart is that you would hear and you would see Jesus through all of this. But what I wanted to do was just say a few words about the, the places that people go as referenced in the Bible without losing track of our first Peter passage. I already mentioned Tartarus, this prison, but let's start with Sheol. You ever heard of Sheol or Hades? Sheol and Hades are the same thing, same place. It's just the Hebrew and the Greek word. So in the Old Testament, you'll read of Sheol, New Testament, you'll read of Hades, different language, same place. And this is a place where all people go uh, when they die to await the judgment, to await resurrection. It's a place of waiting. It's mentioned many times in the Bible, and we learn in some of these reference, uh, references that this is a place with, quote, no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom. No thought. Paul, uh, uh, David, rather, says in Psalm chapter 6 that it is a place with no remembrance. And so apparently, and obviously we could study all of this way more deeply and probably lose a lot of us in the sense of relevance, but it's a place of, of, of some unconscious state, which makes sense with the Bible's description of believers as being asleep, right? Many times they're referred to as sleeping. We're awaiting. We're awaiting the resurrection and ultimately judgment. Speaking of, of judgment, there's another place in the Bible known as Gehenna. This is not the same place as Hades slash Sheol, where people go when they die to await. Gehenna is a place referred to in the Bible of future punishment for the wicked. It's referred to many times by Jesus, many times by the New Testament writers. And what is so, I think, critical to note about this is that as in many other places in the Bible, Jesus uses a real-life place to point to a more ultimate future reality. So, for example, Gehenna is this, this you know, garbage dump outside of Jerusalem that had a very wicked past, child sacrifice and all this stuff. Jesus is using this real-life illustration of a coming reality. It's what the Bible calls a type and an anti-type. Or you may have heard the shadow or the copy and the reality. And I just wanted to, again, and this is really important as we read, an, another example of this is the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And, and, and this is the place where supposedly God dwelled, but what was the tabernacle a shadow of? The heavenly dwelling place of God. So the, it was never about the tabernacle. That was to sort of bring the reality of God's heavenly dwelling place to the people and remind them this is ultimately God with you. So this type, this shadowing, and then the ultimate reality. And that's what Jesus does with Gehenna. He says that there's this thing people could point to and look, but he said there's also very distinctly in Scripture a coming time of eternal judgments. Another example, they're all throughout the Bible. Jonah, the Bible specifically says, just as Jonah was in the whale for three days, so Jesus will be in the belly of the earth for three days. So there's this type, the shadowing, and then the antitype, the reality. Uh, the serpent in Numbers was lifted up, and all who looked to it lived. They were cured. And then it says, just as the serpent was lifted up, what? The Son of Man, Jesus, will be lifted up, and all who look to him will live. So there's these type-antitype relationships. So many, we don't have time to even go through all of them. But one more example that I have to point out, because it's right here in our passage, is baptism. Peter says, he talks about the flood, right? Noah's ark, because you're like, why? how did Noah get into this? We're going we're gonna to talk more about this later. But he says in verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to this. Now, that's our English way of understanding what Peter's saying. He doesn't say which corresponds to this. In the Greek, it's one word, antitipo. He's saying baptism is the antitype, the fulfillment, everything to which the flood was pointing. This event that brought destruction on the world, but also salvation for a family, right? And so he's, he's saying baptism is the fulfillment, but the point to come back to these places that we go is Gehenna was this real place, but also, also a future reality. It's not either or. 
Uh, but this is different. Gehenna is different than where we're at this morning where we're talking. Hopefully you're not at Hades and Sheol uh, this morning. But we're talking about it today. Uh, where you go to await the resurrection. And this brings us to this prison, Tartarus, which is said to be in the deepest part of Hades. Like the pit, the abyss, the lowest part of hell, if you want to think of it that way. And this is where Peter says that God, through the angels who sinned, and the question is, what did they do to get thrown into this place? Now, to answer this question, which will lead us to a description of baptism and ultimately celebration of baptism, I want you to first notice the connection in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, both of his letters, the connection to the days of Noah. To the flood, okay? So, for, for example, 1 Peter, where we are, verse 19, he says, He proclaimed to the spirits because they disobeyed in the days of Noah, verse 20, okay? And then in 2 Peter, it says, we just read it, God threw them into prison. And then right after this, he says, God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and his family. So there's this connection to the time of Noah that reveals the nature of the offense that landed them in this place. And Jude in the New Testament is another writer. And it's, it's funny, once you start studying this, all of these verses just start coming out. Where it's like, well, I never even noticed that verse before. And now I know where it fits. That's another hope of mine for this morning. But Jude says this in verse 6. The angels who did not stay within their position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great Day. So again, there's that prison, imprisoning of these spirits. But what we learn in these verses is not only did they leave their position of authority, but he says they left their place. Literally dwelling. They left their, the, the, the location where they were supposed to stay. They abandoned it. Okay, And then he goes on to basically give us hints of what they did when they left that place. What did they do? They didn't just leave their place. They did something. Jude continues in verse 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah. So there's a comparison taking place to what the angels did. And the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. So he's saying the sin of these angels is in the same category as the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, namely unnatural sexual activity. And they had to leave their proper dwelling as angels in order to pursue this unnatural activity. And so we're narrowing down the uh, answer to our question. And the last stop that we're going to make is Genesis chapter 6. You can turn there or these verses will be on the screen. But this is where we read about the flood and what led up to the flood. Why did God flood the earth? This was such a fascinating study for me this week where I always just thought God got mad at people. And it's like, oh, they're sinners. Whoops, I didn't notice that before. Not at all. This is interesting to me. Genesis 6 says, uh, verse 1, When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. So here's the unnatural activity to which Jude is referring. Uh, And the sons of God is a discussion we could have, but Three other places in the Old Testament that this reference, the sons of God, is used always referring to angelic beings. So he's saying that these these sons of God, these angels, however they did it, I don't know if they they had a, a form, if they had a body, it's possible that God in his punishment disembodied them and sent them down to the pit, the deepest part, which is why perhaps they were begging to go into pigs later, because anything is better than a disembodied existence in the deepest part of hell. (laughs) So please, we'll live in the pigs. We don't care. So there's a lot there that we could go into. We're not going to. Uh, But all this to say these angelic beings saw the daughters of men were attractive, and they pursued unnatural relations with them. And the point that I want us to take away from this is that there was this intermingling with humanity, the demonic with God's creation. And this is when, look at verse, see where are we at? The next verse three, this is when it says, the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever. For he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. Now I always thought of that as like the, the limit on the lifespan of humans from that moment forward. No, 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 this is a countdown clock to the flood. They have 120 years left, which is literally how long it took Noah to build the ark. 
So he's like, there's 120 years left for this generation, and then it's over. But this shows that the purpose of the flood wasn't just because God saw people were bad or sinning, which he would flood us constantly in our rebellion. It is because the human race was unusually and demonically corrupted. Verse 4 gives us some more evidence of this. He says, the Nephilim, which could have been these, these demonic angels or the result of this intermingling, were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. They actually read about the Nephilim in, in the book of Numbers as, as giants, huge, huge men. Would you think, wow, how cool, men of renown, and, except they were desperately, demonically wicked. Which is why, verse 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. (laughs) Ouch. Like, I don't know if you could find a more hopeless expression of humanity than that. Every single desire, thought, act is only evil continually. This is what God saw, and we know why, because of this intermingling and what took place. And this is why in verse 11, the earth was corrupt and filled with violence, and then God decided to flood the earth. But it's at this point, I believe, God threw these spirits, whoever they were, into the deepest part of Hades, Tartarus, prison, which is why I believe God could say, I'll never again flood the earth, because that's never again going to happen. But Jesus goes down, presumably, to these spirits in prison to proclaim, proclaim something. So what does Jesus proclaim? We don't know. I think it's good to just say we don't know. We weren't there, right? But we do know there is a Greek word that means to preach the good news, and it's euangelizo. And this word is used by Peter in the next chapter of his letter, 1 Peter 4, but not here. He uses a different word for Jesus proclaiming. It's the word keruso, which means to proclaim publicly. Think of this as like a public service announcement. (laughs) I'm just proclaiming. This is what's happened. The the idea behind proclaiming good news is, hey, come respond to what God has done for you. The idea behind this is, hey, FYI, this is what's just happened. And by the way, what what could we imagine Jesus might be proclaiming to these spirits right here? I won. (laughs) This is what I've done. I've paid for sins. He's making this announcement. And so I would say that that Jesus was announcing good news, the good news as we know it. The the thing, though, is good news sounds very different depending on which side you're on. Because like we hear it, Jesus died, rose again. Whoa, yay. But to the demons, that's not good news. So he's making this announcement. And and what I think is going on, and this is a way big oversimplification, this is Jesus' victory lap. (laughs) This journey he's going on, I know that that's like not, you're not supposed to do that in sports, it's boasting. And we may even think like, well, that doesn't sound like Jesus, a victory lap. Because like, isn't this like gentle lamb holding Jesus? Did you know though that the Bible says that when Jesus returns, it'll be on a white horse and he will make war with and judge his enemies? The book of Revelation says he's going to make war with his enemies from a white horse. So Paul It says these verses, Colossians chapter 2, that Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authority. Speaking of war, how do you do that? And then he says he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Can you picture Jesus purposely and publicly shaming someone? That's what he did to the evil demonic spirits and saying, I won, you lost. The reason for this is so that even these demons, every single one of his enemies would know that he is Lord. And this is Philippians chapter 2, a line which I often miss in these verses. God exalted Jesus and he gave him the name that said, above every name that, what? At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Where? In heaven and on earth and under the earth. What's that all about? I think it's this. Every place, every one, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even the spirits in the deepest part of hell are forced to recognize his victory. 
Which is why Peter says in verse 22 of our chapter, Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. It's done. And so he's proclaiming his victory. And, and it's possible at this point, again, another track we could go down, we're not going to go, uh, that Jesus also sets some human captives free at this point. I don't know. Uh, Ephesians 4, Paul says this, which is interesting. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And then there's this verse that I read, and I'm kind of like, what in the world? Verse 9, he says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended? into the lower regions of the earth. Anyone ever read that and they're like, what? That's what Peter's talking about. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. That's the goal. The goal is that the glory and the victory and the salvation of Jesus and of God would be known in every place. And there's this fascinating picture that Paul uses that we just read in verse 8 where he says that he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, there was, this was a really well-known picture that Paul's readers would have read this and known right away of these military leaders who would conquer their enemies. And on the way back, they, they'd be leading a, a host of captives, literally a train of captives, and then they would be giving gifts to people along the way. And people would be saying, yay, you won, right? And they would be handing out these Gifts, which they got from, where do you think? Their enemies. They plundered their enemies, and on their way home, they're, they're spreading out the love. And I just think it is so fascinating that Jesus goes in to this deepest part of Hades to speak to these spirits, to basically plunder them and proclaim his victory. And then when he comes back out in a sense, he gives spiritual gifts to his church for his glory. <laughs> I don't know. But I think it's cool. I think Jesus is saying, like, I'm taking away what you misused and abused, and I'm giving it to my body for the sake of my glory. And that's what you see in Ephesians 4 as you keep reading is he gives these gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, all of these spiritual gifts for the building up of the body. He turned what was an evil, horrible moment into his glory and our good. <laughs> So he, he, he's leading this trail of captives, whatever that means. But this statement, actually, he led a host of captives, is so significant. Uh, the, the Greek literally means he captivated captivity itself. So I think it's actually a mistranslation to say he had captives because there's no reference to individuals in this Greek verse. It's he, he took captivity itself captive. And you may think, well, okay, well, what's, what's that mean? He, he's big picture. He's like, I don't, I don't like my creation being enslaved. I'm not just handpicking a few captives. Cool, I got some people to take with me. I don't want captivity. And that makes sense. When Jesus came to earth and proclaimed his reason for coming in Luke chapter 4, he said, I came to preach good news to the poor. I came to set captives free. I came to give sight to the blind, right? I want to restore things to the way I made them to be before evil entered the picture. And so Jesus in this moment, he's not just taking some captives. He is taking captivity itself captive. <laughs> and I think he is saying to these spirits who so many years previously had taken captive the human race, who had corrupted God's world, and he's saying, I won. Because I want you to think for a second back to Genesis chapter 6, which we just looked at, these angels who, who came down and intermingled with with the daughters of men and basically just messed everything up and it led to the flood. Who do you think was behind that? Satan, right? Who, who do you think is behind rebellion against God? Satan, who, who do you think prompted those angelic beings to leave their position that God had given them and to leave their place and to go mess with God's creation? Satan. The question is, why would Satan do this? Well, if you back up three chapters in Genesis, chapter 3, right after the first sin, we have the first promise of a redeemer where God makes his promise he's like I'm there's gonna become a redeemer one day it's all gonna be made right this isn't the end of the story but to whom does God make the first messianic promise Satan Genesis 3 verse 15 God said I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed he the seed of the woman Jesus in this case will bruise your head and you will strike his heel. Now, God is telling Satan here, and we could word it all kinds of ways and look at different scriptures. He's basically saying, you may think you've won, buddy, with what you did here in the garden. 
And you know what? There's going to come another time when, when you're going to think you've won at the cross. You're, you're going to see my Redeemer, my Messiah on the cross. You're going to think, I did it. I got it. And you're, you're going to strike his heel. And it's going to hurt. But you know what's going to happen after that? He's going to crush your head. You're going to be done. And so from this first promise, this first messianic promise made to Satan, not to humans, made to Satan, what do you think his mindset is from this point forward? (laughs) My clock is ticking. And my destruction, according to the, the mouth of God, is directly tied to what? The seed of a woman. Which, by the way, that doesn't make any sense. Women don't have seed. Men have seed. But this is the only instance ever in the history where Jesus did not have an earthly father with earthly seed, but the Holy Spirit, right? So there's very specific prophecy in there where Jesus is is referenced by God to Satan. And from that moment forward, Satan has been doing everything he can to corrupt the human line, to destroy God's people, to undermine God's plan. Because he's basically saying, if I can demonically corrupt people, how in the world can God's holy Messiah come through a demonically corrupt line? And we could have a whole message on the historical ways Satan has attempted to destroy God's people and to corrupt humanity. But isn't it fascinating that just three chapters after God makes this promise, it's through the seed of a woman that your destruction will come. Three chapters later is when these angels came down and messed with creation. And then the flood. And then God's like, get to prison. This is never going to happen again. Satan thinks he's won, and then God floods the earth. And I'm thinking Satan at this point is like, yeah. Except that one man was chosen by God. One man in his family found favor, and God used them to continue his plan of redemption to bring hope to humanity. One man, through him, God's plan of redemption would move forward. And this is where baptism comes in. And this is where the flood is simply a shadow and a type of baptism and what Jesus did at the cross. It's another moment Satan thought he'd won, but then God, just like he provided a way with the ark, with Noah, he provides a way through Jesus, our Messiah, for us to be saved and for us to escape judgment. And God says, hey, here's the boat. Get on, right? That's the ultimate reality. And so baptism literally tracks this journey Jesus went on. He goes down, under, he goes way down. And isn't it, aren't you thankful that we don't like hold people down? If you're wanting to be baptized this morning, we won't do that, I promise And why is that? Because that's not the picture. The picture is death could not hold him. He's the author of life. It's impossible for the author of life to be conquered by death. And so Jesus came out. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 that he tasted death for everyone. But it was just a taste. A thousand years earlier, there's this prophecy in Psalm 16, which is restated in Acts chapter 2, that he was not going to let his Holy One see decay. In other words, he wasn't there laying in the grave long enough to even start decaying before God brought him back out into the first ever resurrection body. And baptism is this picture of Jesus' victory over sin and death and everything that plagues us and everything that holds us captive. God says, it's done. It's done. I've defeated it. And you know what? We still live in the reality of it because we're in this fallen world and we're in these fallen bodies. But don't worry. The story's not over. And he's coming back and he's going to make all things new and all things right. And captivity will be permanently captivated and gone. And baptism is a public declaration. It is saying as we go down and we come back up, it's saying it is impossible for Jesus to be held by death. And it is impossible for those who put their trust in him to be held by death. That's the gospel. That's what God is offering to us. And he describes baptism again as this, the antitype, the ultimate fulfillment of what happened at the flood. And just a couple words, baptism, in verse 21, he says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. I've had lots and lots of conversations with several friends about that verse, right? We can go on and on about that. But Peter, I think, does it very well. He clarifies very quickly, not the removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, what saves you is not some physical act. It's not not washing dirt off your skin and now you're somehow saved. It is a heart change represented in the external following of obedience in baptism. 
That's what this is. It, it's an appeal. That word literally means desperately seeking. It's desperately seeking God for a good conscience. It's saying, God, I want a clean heart. God, I'm lost without you. God, I know I don't stand a chance. God, I want on the boat before the water starts coming. And you're appealing to God. And you're saying, God, I know I'm messed up. I know I have problems and I can't fix that. But you can and you did. That's what baptism is. It's the external picture of a heart that's crying out to God. And this word that's conscience, with a good conscience, that literally means with knowledge, calm science, with knowledge. Meaning, and this is just a bit of a side note, you can't be baptized, at least biblically, unless you have knowledge of your sin, knowledge that you need a Savior. This is a choice I'm making. This is what it means for me. That's what baptism is biblically. We're appealing to God. Now, just one more thing. On what basis are we appealing to God? Many people will stand before God and say, God, I was active in the church my whole life. And he'll say, according to Matthew 7, I never knew you. And they'll say, but God, I, I, I was constantly trying to make myself a better person. And he'll say, I never knew you. The only basis by which we can appeal to God to be saved, to be rescued from coming judgment, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the only basis. It's the fact that Jesus lived the life that I could never live, you could never live, and he died the death we deserved, and then he proved that death couldn't hold him. And he went and told those spirits, you, you think you've won, but you haven't. See you later. And then he was out of there. The only basis for salvation is Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And that's the point of, of Noah and the ark is, is God is appealing to humanity and saying, guys, there's a judgment coming. Get on the boat. And people laughed and they mocked and they thought, you're crazy. And the question is, who's going to get on the boat? Who's going to step forward and say, Jesus, you are Lord I'm with you. I don't know what that's going to mean. I don't know how my friends are going to respond. I don't care. I'm in. That's what it means to get on the boat. You see, the flood meant destruction for many people and salvation for others. Same event. Very different experience depending on whether or not you were on the boat. And the same is true of Jesus' resurrection. We say, yes, Jesus, you're resurrected. But if you're not there with him, in him, it's not good news. And Jesus speaks directly of this in Matthew chapter 24. He says, concerning the day and the hour of my return, he's talking, nobody knows. They're, they want to know, Jesus, when is this all going to go down? Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son. Jesus doesn't know when Jesus is coming back. But the Father only. There's going to be a moment when the Father says, now. Just like the waters opened up and began to flood the earth and people went, wait, wait, what? And he's like, I've been telling you, you've been ignoring me. There's going to be a moment, and, and Jesus says, for in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man right now. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. They're just having a good time. They're living life. It's no big deal. Until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware, until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Translation, people are going about their business, ignoring God's offer to be saved. Ignoring God's offer to have their sins forgiven, to be right with God, and to be back with God. And just as in the days of Noah, that's so fascinating because in verse 1 of Genesis 6, it says that the, the population of the earth was increasing. Is that happening today? Verse 2 of Genesis 6, it says that there's demonic activity and the rejection of God's design for sexuality. Absolutely today. He goes on in verse 5 that evil is running rampant in the world. Do we see that? Verse 11, he says there's corruption and the earth is filled with violence. Do we see that? He says people are eating and drinking and marrying and just having a good time and going about their business. Do we see that? Just as in the days of Noah. But you know what else is the same as the days of Noah? There's hope. There's hope. God has provided a way for us not to experience punishment or judgment. He's saying you, there's a way out. Do you want it or, or not? Friends, listen, hear him. We are, I, I sometimes think as Americans, we, we think of ourselves as, as more sophisticated than all this. Than the God who made all things by the power of his word. 
Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Another shadow of Christ. Who was the one who ultimately found perfect favor in the eyes of the Father? Who was the one who walked the perfect life with God that we could not walk? Who's the one who died the death we just... Who's the one who came? Jesus. He is the one that is this fulfillment of, of this Old Testament picture of judgment and salvation, depending on whether or not you were on the boat. He proclaimed his victory over sin and death to the darkest, deepest parts of Hades, and then he came out of there and he did that so that all who believe in him, all who follow him through baptism, this representation of what God has done on the inside of us will experience the exact same victory and not taste death. So I just want to say in closing that if you've not responded to that invitation today, I know, guys, there's so many voices in our culture. There's so much noise. There's so many ads on Instagram and Facebook. Buy this, do this, think this. And I just pray we would hear through the clutter this morning to God's invitation to be saved. That if you're outside of that, however good or bad you think of yourself has nothing to do with this. It is this, are you on the boat? Is your faith in Jesus Christ, the only one who lived the perfect life, who God put there on purpose for our sins so that we could be righteous in his eyes? Do you want that? And so I just want to encourage you. The Bible teaches that we don't know the day or hour that Jesus is coming back. But when the Father says, this is it, that's, that's, that's it. There's no evidence biblically that there's another chance. We'd have to make that up if there was. But anybody who wants to, God says, anyone who wants to can come and be saved. And you don't have to pay anything. You don't have to do anything special. You just bring yourself and say, I want this, Jesus. So we're going to have a time right now where we celebrate baptisms. There's, I think, some people who are scheduled to be baptized. We're also going to open the table for anybody this morning that God is calling you. He's, you hear his voice in your heart, and there's that aching, and you say, yes, that, this is for me. Let's just have today be the day you step up here and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. But would you pray with me first? Pastor Donnie will come and lead us through this next time. God, we are in awe of your, your mercy and your glory and that none of us deserves the least of your attention, your steadfast love and your mercy, and yet you lavish us with your love. You're so good, God. And, and lots of times when we talk about judgment or punishment or what's coming, there's this, there's this humanistic way of thinking, well, that's harsh of God. <laughs> And we completely ignore the fact that you have offered a way of salvation free of charge to anybody who wants it. That you don't play favorites. You don't pick and choose and say, only these people. You say anybody who wants to, young, old, male, female, black, white, it doesn't matter. How merciful you are to give us a way of escape, God, so that we don't fall into the same fate as these demons, as, as the enemy who has been against you from the beginning. God, we want to respond to your mercy this morning. We do respond. And we look forward to this celebration of new life through baptism and this picture of the journey you went on for us so that we could follow you. Amen.